Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mary Krogan, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for UC Davis. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the second event in the 2021-22 season of the UC Davis Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. For today's event and also the following one in February, we are bringing you a presentation in a wholly virtual mode. While we are grateful to have this safe option for our forums, we look forward to resuming on-campus events in tandem with live streaming later in the season. The UC Davis Forums was established in 2012 by our former provost and executive vice chancellor, Ralph Hexter. Each academic year, we present about a half dozen lectures by experts from a range of disciplines. The series is unique in its purpose. It seeks to promote informed and thoughtful dialogue among members of the campus community and the public on the following subjects. The major challenges facing the public university, ways of responding to those challenges, and how the public university is evolving. With the goal of helping the public university best serve society and individuals, we pose the following question. What should and can the public university be in the 21st century? In our preceding nine seasons, the UC Davis Forums has presented distinguished speakers on a wide range of topics pertaining to the public university and the social good. These have included educational access and affordability, sexism and racism in the academy, and the relationship between academic mission and metrics of success. And these are among many other topics. Looking ahead, you won't want to miss our next event. Harvard economics professor Susan Dinarski will speak about higher education, inequality, and social mobility on Monday, February 7th, again via Zoom. You can find information about all of this season's forums, along with videos of past events on the series website, forums.ucdavis.edu. This afternoon, we are delighted to welcome as our featured speaker, Stella Flores, Associate Professor of Higher Education and Public Policy at the University of Texas at Austin. The topic of her talk is Latinx Identity Educational Pipeline Stories, Barriers and Successes from State Policy. This topic is an important one across academia, but it is of especially keen interest to those institutions like UC Davis that have a large and growing population of Latinx students. Immediately following Professor Flora's presentation, there will be a Q&A period. And before our speaker is formally introduced, I wanna thank the following individuals and groups who have made this event possible. First, the UC Davis Forum Steering Committee led by Martin Kenny, Distinguished Professor of Community and Regional Development in Human Ecology. The other members of the committee are Professors Raquel Aldana, Scott Carell, Marcela Quasar, Jonathan Eisen, Ralph Hexter, Maisha Wynn, and Mark Yarborough. The Community and Regional Development Program in the Department of Human Ecology should also be thanked. They've joined the Office of the Provost in sponsoring this event. Everyone in our audience, I wanna thank you for making time in your busy schedule to join us. And finally, our greatest appreciation goes to Professor Flores for sharing your knowledge and insights on an important and timely topic related to the public university. Now, I will yield the podium to Professor Cuellar of our School of Education, who will introduce Professor Flores. 
Thank you so much, Provost Krogan. So uh, I'll, as uh, Provost Krogan mentioned, Dr. Stella Flores is an Associate Professor of Higher Education and Public Policy at the University of Texas at Austin, where she holds a cross-school appointment in the Department of Education, Leadership and Policy, and Curriculum and Instruction. And she is also the Director of Research and Strategy for the Education Research Center at UT Austin, as well as the co-editor of AERA Open. Her research examines the effects of state and federal policies on college access and completion outcomes for low-income and underrepresented populations, including immigrant and English learners. Dr. Flores has published widely on demographic changes in U.S. schools, affirmative action in higher education, and also minority-serving institutions. Her scholarship in these areas has been seminal, and her impact has been wide, informing many educational policies at the state and federal level. For example, in 2003, her co-authored work was cited in the dissenting opinion of the Gratz versus Bollinger decision in the US Supreme Court and in various amicus briefs submitted to the Supreme Court on affirmative action. Dr. Flores has received numerous awards recognizing her deep impact in the field of education. In 2017, she was recognized as one of the top 25 women in higher education and beyond by Diverse Issues Magazine. And she's also been recognized as one of the top 200 scholars in Education Week's uh, RHSU Ed Edu Scholar Public Influence ranking since 2015. And just two weeks ago, when the rankings came out, she is still on the list uh, for 2022. So as you can see, she's an incredible leader and role model for so many of us who admire her and look up to her and for the, the work she, she does to, to impact the lives of so many students. So we are in for a treat this afternoon. I know she's presenting new research that she hasn't um, presented elsewhere. So please join me, join me in welcoming her to the UC Davis forums. Thank you so much. That's such a kind introduction uh, to both of you, Marcela and Mary and Emily, thank you for all the organization. There was so much uh, work that went into this and then it had to be <laughs> online, but that's okay. Uh, I'm happy to be here and, and my dog gets to watch me present. So how's that? Um, <laughs> so I, what I, uh, first of all, let me, let me thank again, everyone who's been involved. Um, when I started this, I know it's 3 p.m. there, 5 p.m. here. Um, one of the things I also just want to acknowledge broadly is any condolences um, to anyone who's lost uh, fo friends, family members, uh, so many valued people in our lives, positions also work um, because of the pandemic. And I know that everyone's just trying their best, even, even those uh, who seem to be um, not struggling. We never know what people are doing or what struggles are going through. So I just want to acknowledge that um, every day is a new day. And so thank you for showing up today in particular. Um, I hope that you find that your time has been well spent. So I'm excited uh, to present this research. For those of you that don't know, it's, I was born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley. So South Texas, about 20 minutes uh, from the Mexican border. Uh, born and raised in Texas, went to different uh, places for school and work and so forth. And now I'm back at Texas. So it's, it is very nice to be back home. Uh, but I also spent some time working um, in the state legislature as an intern, but then uh, more time in working in the federal government. So public policy, I went to the LBJ School of Public Affairs as well, um, has always been part of how I see the world. Also, because I, I believe my parents had great opportunity because of particular policies during the Johnson administration, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the uh, Higher Education Act that opened financial aid in a way it had never been before. All those made it possible, so those policies made it possible so that they could be first-generation college. And then it gave me the opportunity to not only go to college, but really expand uh, my opportunities for the kind of college I wanted to go to. So in the back of my mind, I've always been, I've always thought that where you live matters, uh, the time you grow up in matters, the policies that surround a book and your educational journey, all that is likely to play a role. Now through various um, analyses and, and methods, we're, we're able to find out whether something maybe did or did not have an association or, or an effect on, on uh, particular educational outcomes. And I've been focusing on Latinos for quite a while since my undergraduate days. And so this paper is really a culmination to understand 
uh, using census data, which is representative at the state level over time, does where you live matter in terms of educational opportunities for college success for Latino students? Does the origin of your Latino identity matter? Does where you go to school matter? Do the types of schools present in your educational journey that you have access to, does that matter as well? And to what extent do policies that are educationally enhancing or opportunity enhancing versus opportunity constraining, and I'll talk about what I mean by that, um, how does that matter in a Latino student's educational journey? So I'm gonna go ahead and start um, the PowerPoint. Now you're gonna see a lot of figures. I, I'm, I'm a little bit data crazy. I, I'm gonna to try to keep it um, in a way that doesn't glaze your eyes over, but I, but I think these um, analyses, these figures, these trends are, are really important. Um, they are measured from 2006 to about 2019. So right before the 2020 census, we will update those. Um, as we know, there's been some research, some, um, updates that the 2020 census for various reasons, maybe not, may not be uh, as healthy as perhaps we had hoped it would be in terms of data, but those are things we're finding out. So this is pre-2020 data, but right at the cusp of, of the turn of the decade. Okay, I know that there's gonna be a Q&A later and I'm happy to answer questions as well. I'll also have my email address and, um, who can share? Let's see. Mm. So give me a second. I'm trying to figure out how to share. How do I share? There you go. Okay. Um, if you want to get a hold of me uh, later. Okay. So let's start this. Um, I'm calling this educational pipeline stories uh, because I do think uh, there, there are various narratives of a pipeline. I'm mostly going to focus on enrollment and completion, um, but as we know, the story of opportunity starts way before then. So most of the work I'm presenting is from this new paper I co-authored with uh, my graduate students at NYU, Tim Carroll and Suzanne Lyons. I will occasionally talk about some other uh, stories out of California and Texas. Um, co-authored by uh, some of these other individuals, Tatiana Melguizo and, and David Velasquez from USC as an example. So uh, much thank you to graduate students. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with some national data story um, and, and, and at the point of the final results of policy story outcomes, I'll do that at the very end. The main message I want to leave here is that what, have we, what we've done up to date on educational, changing educational policy and programs is not enough. It hasn't worked in a sufficient and efficient manner. Um, and so we really dove into this to understand why. So what are we not doing right? Um, previous decades, we had better integration efforts. We had better resources. And all of a sudden, things are actually getting worse to a certain extent. Um, we think about Latino student outcomes and segregation. It's not just about race. We have segregation at the income level, the racial level, the language level, the citizenship level, yet our public policies aren't be really being formulated in a way that addresses all these other elements in play. What we're arguing here, it's time that we stop creating public policy that only is, is designed for, for example, a 1980s population, right? We are no longer a predominantly English speaking black and white society. And yet most of our, pol our policies are tailored, our, our research design, uh, designs for some of our biggest well-funded studies are not designed with a Latino student in mind. Maybe you'll get race in there, maybe you'll get ethnicity in there, but they are wholly, um, missing of the Latino student identity. So we're gonna talk, about, I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the consequences of that and maybe how to improve the consideration of the Latino student identity in formulating better programs and policies that um, may lead to better educational outcomes. 
so part of what's happening here is that identity, Latino identities, I'm not saying they're causal because we're not gonna randomly assign Latino identities. However, um, how they are treated, whether they're prized, challenged, rejected, or considered not relevant in an educational system's value system of what works or what is uh, basically of importance does matter. And that's how identities can neither be valued, challenged, rejected, or ignored. A state's policy structure and knowledge of this population, the integration of their assets, not just a constant recounting of deficits, can play a role in educational pathway successes. And part of this is that we actually have research um, that begins to really outline what should be considered, but it has been ignored or not accounted for in many of our largest research studies and many of our major research studies. I've sat on various committees, standing committees for um, National uh, Center for Education Statistics, the IES committees, other committees. I'm constantly the only Latina. When Latinos are the majority population of every district and the money we are sending out to researchers is supposed to affect Latinos when they're not part of this consideration of the studies, right? There, there's something wrong with this, and then this needs to be addressed. There's this um, very alluring fascination with scaling interventions, and not that that's a bad thing, but the way we are formulating interventions is not appropriately considering the different elements of Latino student identities. So for example, even if results are positive on a large scale level, we actually may be underestimating how well we can do for Latino students. Um, and therefore we're not utilizing the ultimate efficiency uh, and, and uh, e energy of the study. And, and we're not spending the money the way it could be in a more efficient way. In other words, when we have large scale non-identity attentive interventions, we are not being sufficiently um, efficient and it's a, a good enough educators to figure out the right solutions. The research and practice and who does that research and practice should be representative of the populations they intend to serve. So why should we care? What is the big problem here? Is it a problem? Is it an issue? The key problem, and uh, Francis Contreras, Patricia Gandara, others have talked about this, that as the Latino population has grown, especially in the nation's public school district, population growth doesn't mean better representation, nor does it mean greater acceptance. Latinos are now the majority in schools and colleges. The growth of the Latino population is even more present uh, than before in local and state economies and in these other sectors that are not, not necessarily education. But along with that demographic growth, what we've often seen is that this growth is met with anti-Latino state policies and other challenges to social and civic services and rights. So what uh, Francis Contrera calls the Brown paradox. You see a growth of individuals which I, want, I mean, I thought it would mean, oh, we have a lot of people that well, more rep, that would mean more representation, perhaps more political power, but instead there's been the counter movement and we've seen a lot of more anti-Latino policies come through. There actually may be anti a lot of people too, but when it starts to focus in on immigration and language, um, driver's license related to that, among other things, it does, it, it, it does ring very closely to uh, the Latino identity. So why should we care? Why is this even important to higher education? Higher education is seeing a decline of students. Community college students, we saw it where, where everyone's talking about that in terms of higher education, the drop in community college student enrollment, which was likely to happen, but is now even more sped up, right? Because of pandemic issues among other uh, employment, um, forces, 
Uh, but the future of, edu of, of higher education, the demography is this. We're going to see a decline of white students in higher education. And uh, where we will see a growth in higher education, like the Southwest, California, Arizona, Texas, this is where Latinos are growing at their fastest rate. This is where you're seeing the most high school graduates. So like it or not, the reality is that Latino students will be central figures in the enrollment and completion calculus of all of US higher education, which brings, us, brings me and my um, co-authors and, and many other researchers back to the central point of we need Latino attentive policy and programmatic approaches needed to move the needle on college success. College success for Latinos is going to mean increased wages for all the community that employs those Latinos, right? There's been lots of research out of economics. Every time uh, an, an increase in college degrees means actually an increase in wages. Um, not only for college graduates, but also high school graduates to a certain extent. So that research is there. You have communities that are predominantly Latino. That's, that's no different. That's going to be as important. So part of what we're doing here is arguing that the lack of specific attention that exists uh, in the Latino college access process, that is affecting the efficiency and improvement of interventions. So we are proving, we're, we're really arguing for Latino attentive approaches. I'll go into what that means. And by doing that, we um, examined a number of studies looking at what works for Latino students, both qualitative and quantitative. And uh, we focus on four areas, research areas that are really critical. And I'll talk about that in a bit. And then we provide four key recommendations on what should be included in these Latino attentive approaches. Part of that is under the guise of state policy. So at the end, what we'll do is, or what I'll do is present what state policies are most likely to help or hinder Latino students living in those particular states. I mentioned that available research exists, even if it can be improved, which all research can be improved, methods are developing every day. There is enough research out there to inform better interventions, but it's not being translated into public policy initiatives, right? We're not reading across disciplines. Uh, some disciplines are not as diverse as others, so they don't have the depth and um, breadth of research on Latino students, and so they should be reading across disciplines. In the end, Latinx researchers or researchers of Latino issues are not sufficiently represented in a nation's college success solution machinery. Finally, this demographic mismatch between higher education professionals, policymakers, and Latinx students um, that are now the majority of every uh, school district in the nation, just Part of what we're recommending here is that if you have an institution, which is probably 90% of institutions, higher ed institutions, where you don't have enough Latino representation at the leadership level, then we encourage understanding the Latino student broadly and what matters for them at a deeper level to integrate into your current practices, right? Um, just because there's a mismatch doesn't mean that we should give up hope nor does it mean that we should keep diversifying the pipeline to leadership, but we're trying to offer some solutions in which this mismatch can be mitigated. And my research is always composed of multiracial, it's a multiracial research team. Um, so that's really important, not only to producing the research, but also um, making sure that everyone is responsible for putting it forward. Okay, so I'm gonna start with some um, figures, and you've probably seen, you know, the, the sad part is that this hasn't changed much over the last 10 years. It's, it's the same uh, in terms of who's doing better, who's doing worse. If you, if you look at the enrollment side on, which is my left, right, we do see that their uh, Latino students are doing better represented by the orange line. Um, at some point, they 
um, surpass the enrollment of black students. So there's been a lot of talk about how much better, how much more Latinos we have in college. Yes, we do. But that doesn't mean public policy has been more effective. It just means there's more Latinos and any demog demographer can tell you that. So unless you actually test that we've had more effective uh, public policy and programmatic initiatives to increase Latino enrollment, this is just demographic uh, reality happening. When we look at college completion on the right, you'll see that um, Native American students, unfortunately, are still at the, at the bottom of um, the different uh, racial groups examined here. Latino students do not surpass anyone else other than Native American students, and the line is quite flat, right? So this is the story of the last 10, honestly, probably last 20 years. Increase in Latino college enrollment to some extent, stagnant college completion rates. So as we begin to, as I begin to look a little bit further into these um, different, uh, the role of different identities within the Latinx population, I'm highlighting some of the ones that we'll take into account, right? So race, income, language use, country of origin, citizenship process, um, in some of my other studies, the segregation levels, the type of uh, institutional sector, and for Latinos, the HSI sector, Hispanic serving institution sector is of critical importance, and then the state policy context. For those of you not familiar with higher ed, the state context, state policy drives higher ed success. We can't do much without federal financial aid, for example, that's, that's, that tends to be the territory of federal aid, but the, uh, how a state funds institutions so much of the regulation and the territory of higher ed is at the state level. If we don't understand what's happening at the state level, if we don't account for it, if we don't go deep and understand it, we're gonna be making incorrect um, assertions, assumptions and solutions. Um, what I wanted to do quickly, and I won't spend too much time on this, but I do want to show that there are differences, right, among the different Latino identities. I think a lot of the narrative goes on, oh, well, the Cubans are doing great, and the Cubans have always been doing great. Okay, well, maybe, but it's not just a Cuban story in terms of uh, Latino success, right? Cent in some cases, Central American students are doing better in some states versus others. South American students um, actually have much higher rates of, of enrollment and completion than do Cuban students. Um, the Black and Mexican rates are, tend to be pretty similar, right? So is this about language and immigration status? If we're still seeing such uh, low rates uh, for uh, Black college students, that's a different story and one that should not be ignored. In fact, is another deep national and state crisis um, in most states. Um, and then I'm happy to talk about uh, from some of our other work. Uh, I'll bring it back to um, Latino students, but we do talk about um, how Black Latinos do on college access and success in a later slide. So part of um, another visual way to see this is how students are doing Latino students by different identities by enrollment and completion. And you see the different lines there, the red being the Mexican line, a Mexican origin line, the orange being Puerto Rican. So Puerto Rican students right, have citizenship. So they, while they're um, uh, part of the Latino diaspora, they're also part of, they're, they're also a group with citizenship. Right, you see South American students are doing quite well on enrollment and on completion, they, they, um, they're similar, but still higher than Cuban students represented by the green line. Um, and Central American students often are, are, are in competition, if you want to say that, that's not the right word, but um, with Mexican students. So this is, this is a portrait of how things have been for quite a while now. Now, what about Latino compared to white students? What I wanna call attention to here is that the solid lines represent the different states um, enrollment 
into right enrollment into college and BA or higher um, for uh, the different populations, but the dotted line represent the gaps, right? The gaps between white and Latinos. So let's take a look at Florida. Florida is a very interesting case, has always been a very interesting case, right? Predominantly Cuban, some South American. And what we see in Florida, and we've done stuff, done studies with, with other um, co-authors, Toby Park and Samantha Viano, um, on the Florida case. And we actually see that the, uh, if you see the, the zero on the left um, and the yellow line right under, that means Florida has the lowest, the smallest gap between Latino and whites of any other state. And we know that the, the Latino population in Florida is quite different. In some cases, um, it's like almost zero. So basically Latinos in Florida are enrolling at the same level as white students. If we look at um, blue, which is Arizona, Arizona has the biggest gap, I'm still talking on enrollment, between Latino and white students of all of these top Latino states that we have studied. The others are kind of mixed all together. But then if we turn over to, for example, the BA or higher rate, a thing to put to, um, oops, all right, how do I go back? A thing to keep in mind is also some similar um, results because what I do wanna point out in California, the red line for enrollment, you know, they're, they're almost right under Florida. Enrollment between the gaps between whites and Latinos in California, it's probably, you know, it's almost better than any of the other states except Florida. But look at the completion line for California, um, uh, the right side, uh, quad quadrant and um, the right figure, for example. And California is at the very bottom. Arizona is doing better on completion, as is Illinois, as is New York, definitely Texas. So we have a very different case here in terms of the white Latino gap, where California is doing better on enrollment, but their completion statistics, and dare I say your completion statistics, because you're in California, are just far worse than they should be. In fact, they're the bottom of the barrel, California. Looking back at the state context right now, again, also by Latino identity, but within each state, how are Latinos doing across different states? And here we see that uh, California, um, South Americans, are pretty much the group doing better in every state that they're represented, including New York, including Florida. Mexicans on average tend to be on the, uh, the, the red line at the bottom, and then Puerto Ricans go back and forth, right, depending on the state that they're in. Um, and Arizona, all we have is Mexican data, so sorry. Um, but, uh, and then in Illinois, Puerto Rican and Mexican origin students are pretty similar. But uh, often what we see is New York, for example, in Florida, Dominican students are actually, um, they're performing uh, better than Puerto Rican on average and better than um, Central American. So all this very tied to immigration policy, who gets to come in, the educational requirements, the financial requirements, connected to immigration entry, which is you know, why South Americans also on average have much higher incomes um, than Mexicans, for example. So uh, all this, it's not like someone was born with better abilities. It's how they came into this country, the social and financial capital that they brought that is then intergenerational and is passed on to other uh, their family members. So this is BA completion. Similar setup, again, we see South Americans at the top in Florida, Cubans cross back and forth, uh, Mexicans um, at the bottom, Puerto Ricans seem to do, are, are doing pretty well in Texas com in comparison to the Central American and uh, Mexican counterparts. But in California, Central American uh, students are, are doing better than Mexican students, which is different from their progress in Texas. So how does state policy fit into this? We examine the top 10 states, so the states with the, 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 high, the highest uh, 
percentage of la young adult Latino population. And as you see here, we look, California has the most Latinos followed by Texas, Florida, New York, Arizona, Illinois, and so forth in terms of numbers. Uh, then you see the percentages, but we also put in policies or programs that are very relevant to Latino students according to the research, right? So Hispanic serving institutions in the state, but this time we divided it up. It's not just the total number, but the two year or the four year, because where you start college matters on whether you'll be able to graduate on time, transfer it all and so forth. We also looked at in-state tuition policies, right? The state dream max and all, if you look at this, all these, the top 10 states that have Latino populations, except for Pennsylvania, all have some form of a state dream act which is really quite impressive in terms of financial aid i think it's seven out of ten policies uh seven sorry seven out of ten states have some form of state financial aid there's been a lot of advocacy a lot of work done to do this so not only the policy to allow the discount on tuition but additional state financial aid then we looked at affirmative action, which um, considers race as one factor of consideration in college admissions, both selective institutions, in some cases scholarships. And you see that California still has its banned. Texas was banned for a time. Now it's sort of institutional autonomy around it. So Texas A&M doesn't use race, but uh, UT Austin does. Some states have no policy. Florida, it's banned. Arizona is banned. Washington is banned, others don't have policies, but there's a fair number of, of states that are high, that have high numbers of Latinos that ban the use of race in college admissions or a consideration. And then bilingual education, that's been a new one because that's been the one that's been in most flux. You had uh, three or four states that banned um, the use of bilingual education, and then some have overturned it, like California, Massachusetts, uh, it's not on here, but they actually overturned it as well. But some of the studies that we're doing now, for example, that we did in California on English learners, they were the, the, the cohorts of students that didn't have bilingual education as a formal policy. Um, I could talk about that in Q&A if needed. So these are the ones we're looking at that the research says are relevant to Latino educational attainment. How did we find this out? Well, I wanna point to four areas that I think are pretty, relevant in terms of not only the factors that matter, but the research that matters. Identity and migration history, that is critical to the Latino educational story. While majority of, of students are US citizens, um, I would say nearly half of Latino families come from mixed citizenship households. So creating programs that don't consider this sort of mix in migration history or that consider what families came in with or did not come in with. It just, it doesn't make any sense. This has to be considered when we think about solutions for educational equity. High school quality and academic achievement, of course, is matters. Academic achievement is important for everyone. But have we considered that Latinos are in schools most likely to be racially and linguistically segregated, that have citizenship concerns that perhaps staff teachers are not familiar with and don't know how to deal with it. College knowledge and affordability, we know that money matters, but most of our um, interventions that have been supposedly, or that are the most successful, did, don't consider migration history, that the system is broadly set up for English speaking families or families that are familiar with the US college system. So while it doesn't mean those other factors don't matter, but we have not gone far enough. If we wonder why there hasn't been enough progress, we're suggesting that maybe we haven't gone far enough to understand our students and the families they come with and the assets they bring. Finally, student ready institutions and states. What do I mean by this? Well, there's been a lot of work in higher ed growing where things institutions need to be student ready, right? Be ready. If you're going to accept the students, be ready for the assets they come with, the challenges they come with, and be ready to um, address those and create the right programming so students can be successful, right? It can be from academic to social to spiritual, all these different things. 
What we're arguing is yes, this is important, but they also need to be very culturally um, attentive, culturally informed about what students are coming with, especially if students are older, come in with families, or come in with a number of responsibilities that poor families often have, uh, it's, you know, regardless of race or ethnicity. But states need to be student ready. We can't have, I mean, it doesn't make sense to have majority Latino student populations and states not, able, state education systems not ready to, for example, hire the right teaching force, create the right teaching force, understand that these families or students might need additional information or a different form of information dissemination, understand that if legislatures are passing anti-Latino, anti-immigrant policies, they're actually hurting themselves and their own state economies. So states and institutions need to be student ready for the populations they serve. There's a major demographic mismatch between who's in the state legislature and who's in the public schools. That doesn't mean that we don't help serve our students regardless of who they are. So in all this, and then I'll go into the final results, I do want to talk about, so what do we mean by Latino attentive research and practice approaches? Um, we were able to review you know, over 50, um, 50 to 75 studies on this. Um, the work of Patricia Perez and Miguel Ceja, they have a wonderful book um, that they've been, um, uh, that they edited a few years ago about Latino college students, Marcela's work on HSIs and, and undocumented students, uh, Dr. Cuellar, who's hosting. Um, Patricia Gander, as I mentioned, and uh, Francis Contreras. There's also a number of non-Latino research who have done very attentive, culturally uh, sensitive work on this as well. And so from this, we come up with four areas that we suggest. Of course, there could be more, but this is what we narrowed in on the four. And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's of no surprise that the centrality of family and educational decision-making is going to be important for Latino families, um, also a lot of immigrant families. Uh, but there's a, a, a lot, you hear a lot of different narratives. Well, it's just the families don't care or the families aren't involved or the families can't speak English. The reality is most parents want their students to do well, but have no idea of how to provide that guidance and coaching. Most of the educational interventions we've come up with for college success are actually trying to recreate the coaching that a student with multiple generations of college graduates in their family are doing, right? Um, for the Latino family, for the Latino student, the family, again, is, is critical in the educational decision-making, which means a a an intervention that only focuses on the student is probably not going to be as comprehensive as, as it would it, if it had included um, members of the family. Institutional agents in the school context, this is the second part of the key scaffolding for college success because parents can be super supportive but have no idea how to take that further. And institutional agents, teachers, principals, um, other individuals, adults, and, and people in the student's life and making that connection to these uh, other um, elements for social mobility are going to be critically important. So all in the institutional agents are the second big part of this. The third part is complexities of college true costs, including proximity. In various studies we've done, not only myself and my colleagues, but others out of economics, Latinos are the group most likely to work. They're the group less likely to be unemployed. And in our cities, there's the group most likely to work while in college. Financial aid is great, but not understanding the true cost of college when working is almost second nature to so many students because they have to have been working. We're not creating an appropriate formula for these students, right? Asking students to stop working it's just not a reasonable request without additional supports. And then proximity. Most students, Latino students are often on a pay as you go plan, um, going to school where their job is, 
right? So, so much of the college cost and college choice is around where employment is. We, our theories don't address that. Our theories on average are still working with the student from 1985. We need to update those. Finally, uh, when, especially when a student is first generation college, what often is not said, there's a lot of work on first generation college students being the first in the family to go to college. But the group with the largest number of first generation students are Latino students. So when they go to college, it's often beyond just wages, but a community win. And so the incentive to go and graduate from college goes beyond wages and perhaps the individual perspective of why someone should get a college degree. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen in the individual format, but there's a community benefit perspective that is not appropriately addressed in these interventions and in these uh, results. Okay, so what do I mean? How do we think about all this research and, and how, is, how are states either using or not using this research in terms of public policy? Well, when we looked at our policies, we hypothesized that we have what we call opportunity enhancing policies and opportunity constraining policies. So before we test our model, we did a logistic regression model I could talk about in the Q&A if needed um, or later, or you can read the paper. The paper's already uh, published. It's uh, Flores, Carroll, and Lyons, uh, 2020. No, what was last year? 2021, sorry. Um, and so our, our opportunity enhancing policies, we have hypothesized are Hispanic serving institutions. We account for two and four year. Um, although we don't know exactly where the student goes to school, but we look at the number of two and four years in the state. Um, whether a state has an in-state resident tuition policy. Now, uh, as you know, we, I showed that all 10 um, have some form of a policy in different formats. And then financial aid for the in-state in tuition policy. Opportunity constraining, ban on bilingual education, ban on affirmative action, and ban on immigrant origin related higher ed policies. So states like South Carolina, they ban, or at least they did as of a few years ago. Um, you can't go to college if you're undocumented. It's, you know, at some point you couldn't even apply. You certainly won't be admitted. You certainly won't get any financial aid. Okay, so what does this mean? What do we learn? What are the results? Are some policies helping or are some policies hindering students more? Are some policies neutral? That's sort of the question that we threw out there. So we looked at Latino students across the nation uh, in the states. The data we have is representative of the state level across different time periods. And what we did is we looked at Latinos who are in the states uh, with these particular policies compared to Latinos who are in states that do not have these policies. Uh, I'm going to interpret this in a, in a more simple way, but this is basically what we did is we looked at enrollment, starting with base, uh, with our, you know, whether someone was of a different origin other than Mexican origin, then we added demographic and citizenship characteristics. And then the key part of our question is we added the different state characteristics, where you live or uh, go to school matters. We did that for enrollment in the green and, uh, BA completion in the red. So the narrative here is that Mexican origin students are actually the group least likely to enroll or complete college of all our Latino group ethnicities. Um, students who only speak, uh, uh, who are not English only speakers, so in other words, speak a language, a language other than English, um, we're not as like, we're less likely to enroll in college and we're less likely to graduate from college. The issue here is that in the census, we don't have appropriate measures of whether someone was an English learner, when they were reclassified, how many years are in English. The census is very broad. This is, and this is a limitation of the data, but it had other advantages. So we went ahead and used this. Um, so Basically, we see there's no advantage to being bilingual using this data. Using California data, we did find a bilingual advantage. Using Texas data, we did uh, find a bilingual advantage, but this is a national picture. Um, we found uh, Latino students who were of Black origin or had uh, African origin were more likely to enroll in college, but not complete. 
uh, it did matter whether a student lived in an in-state resident tuition state or a state DREAM Act, students were, Latino students were more likely to enroll and they were more likely to complete college. Um, and that, that confirms some of the research um, I did back in 2000, I don't even remember now, 10, um, and others have done similar work. Um, the four-year HSI, I seem to have forgotten that column, but, that column, but it turns out it is positive. So um, if a student lives in a state that has a four-year HSI, they are more likely to not only enroll in college, but also complete college. So this is a big one. I apologize for the error there. Living in a state with a four-year HSI is an advantage for enrollment and completion for Latino students. The key thing is that it's a four-year HSI, right? California has, uh, I think, slightly more two years and four-year HSIs. Arizona has a majority of two years, very few four years. So it's not only whether an HSI presence, but a four-year HSI. So that's something to consider that we haven't really, I think the literature addressed appropriately enough. These are new findings on that behalf. Students that live in a state with an affirmative action ban are actually, uh, here it shows that they're more likely to enroll in college, but we don't know what kind of college they enroll in. We don't have the selectivity level. The census doesn't offer that. Um, but we do know they're, they're enrolling more. However, they're not completing. Students who live in a state with an affirmative action ban are significantly less likely to complete college. So one hypothesis here is that if students are enrolling in less selective institutions, right, because they didn't apply to the selective ones because they're not likely, they think they might not likely be um, uh, accept it. So they'll enroll in, in whatever college is there. We know they tend to enroll non-selective schools, maybe two years, uh, two-year institutions, um, maybe go half time. But once they enroll in states with affirmative action bans, they're much less likely to graduate college. So that actually is an opportunity constraining. This, the age of arrival confirms uh, the literature that the older you are when you arrive in the U.S., the less likely you are to go to college. So that confirms it. And then also what we've seen before, females are much more likely to enroll in complete college. So what do we live with? The, the, the findings here, they're not causal, let me be very clear on that, but they are strongly associated and significant. So living in a state that has a DREAM Act, that has a four-year HSI, or more, or more likely to have four HSI, um, is, is uh, our both more likely to enroll in complete college. If you're in an affirmative action ban state, you're less likely to complete college. So I'll end with some recommendations, some broad ones. We did consider again, why we should care about this issue. We know Latinos are gonna be a major force in whether American higher education succeeds, given its decline, given its cost, given the various crises already happening the pool of students are likely to be low income, minority, and Latinos, right? We have to make sure higher education is successful for this group. How is it successful? We need to be very um, attentive to Latino students and what matters and what is likely to uh, improve their educational outcomes. That means research needs to go deeper, it needs to be more inclusive, and the diagnosis approaches need to be more accurate. So integrating these Latino intensive considerations, we hope will lead to better approaches, better diagnosis, be better tailored interventions that will lead to higher college completion. What we have done to date has not worked for college completion. When we looked at our numbers, we ran them uh, different ways to make sure, well, maybe it's just that uh, it's this particular state driving the numbers. Maybe it's just that it's the time to degree that's, um, in other words, you have more enrollees, we haven't given them enough time to complete. We looked at various scenarios and it's not, it's not these other explanations. The, the sad part is the, is the way we're going now, there's no indication, no indication exists that these disparities are gonna disappear. They're not gonna disappear with the current interventions we have. We need different interventions. So what we're doing now is not enough. It's not sufficiently accurate. 
nor is it the most efficient formula. This is not just, and this is not the responsibility of one party, it's various jurisdictions. And the harder part is that we know there are jurisdictions that are working against providing additional opportunity for Latino students. So it is within those jurisdictions that we have to be more creative and more unified in making sure this works if we want higher ed to work. I'll end there and open it up for questions. Let me stop sharing. Okay. I hope that you can um, at least feel this all virtually clapping, uh, Dr. Flores, um, for this wonderful presentation and a lot for us to think about as we um, are one of those states that can do a lot better with our own completion. So I want to invite the audience to uh, please go ahead and use the Q&A function to uh, post questions or also use uh, the, the chat if, if that's easier for you to pose questions. And I'll go ahead and uh, kind of pull from those to pose them um, to, to our wonderful uh, presenter. So somebody did ask about your paper. I did post it on the um, chat. So I can also repost that in a second. Um, but if you wanna uh, state the title of the paper, Dr. Flores, or anything else you wanna add about the paper itself. Sure, the title of the paper is, uh, it's called, just if you remember this, it's easy, Beyond the Tipping Point, Searching for a New Vision for Latino College Success in the US. And it's in a social science journal, it's called the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. Great, thank you so much. So please um, continue or, or please uh, post questions that you may have for our esteemed presenter today. Um, but as we're waiting to hear from folks or, or have those Q and A's uh, come through, I, I, I'll start us off with some questions if that's okay, sure. because there's um, a lot of richness in, in, in the data that I also, um, one of the things that I, I, I'm really curious about with the analysis and you did all of this, um, real uh, deep intra-ethnic dive, right? And looking at Latino student outcomes for the various subgroups. And I'm, I'm curious if you also considered kind of the intersections with like multiracial Latino students who may, you know, be both, um, maybe Afro Latinx or, um, or even be, um, Mexican and Puerto Rican or any sort of so so if you can talk a little bit about if those if that is even possible with these data and if 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 you did look into that kind of what are some of the things that may emerge or what are some of the limitations that we need to consider sure so i think um we did consider latinos who identify um as black origin or african origin um so we did have that in the regression model um you know what we found is uh, they're still more likely to enroll in college than Mexican origin students. Um, but they're also less likely uh, to graduate from college, right? So there's something about, or less likely to graduate than other Latino groups. Um, now, if we start to, to investigate, well, where are Black Latinos most likely to be um, located? It might be New York, it might be, um, Florida, for example. Um, so, and, and then if we go into, well, are, are Black Latinos more likely to be Dominican versus Puerto Rican? And so there are different ways to do it. That's about as far as we can go to, that we did measure Black Latino enrollment and completion compared to other Latino groups. But um, other than that, I think thinking about if we're looking at predominantly, if the highest percentage of Black Latinos are out of the Dominican origin group, for example, uh, where are they located? And uh, we saw that Dominican students um, or in students of Dominican origin are more likely to have higher social capital than Mexican students, right? So they're, they're not at the top of the Latino enrollment um, outcome story, but they're uh, at least in the middle, if not ab above the middle. And there's so much more, you can do so much work with the census, right? And some, we had like eight other graphs and the editor was like, stop. <laughs> You're gonna have to choose, <laughs> you know? So at some point, you know, we probably ran it and then we had to cut it down for the paper. 
Thank you so much. I'm sure there's like multiple papers in, in just yeah. like all of the analyses. Thank you. So, so one of the other questions is, can you um, say a little bit more on the role of language policy um, in your work on higher education access and, and success? Sure. So we've looked at it, you know, where, where you are exposed to language policy matters, right? So when we looked at it in Texas, uh, where there are no bans on, uh, or there haven't been any official bans on uh, bilingual education, our work, uh, what we found, and, and they have this wonderful data set uh, that not only looks at students who were not exposed, Latino students, for example, who were not exposed to bilingual education, or, but that, for example, qualified for bilingual education, but their parents pulled them out. Their parents said, no, we don't want them in there. And we looked at that. What we found was some years from one to three years, which also, you know, might be some of that just might be ability, but some exposure to bilingual education was actually, um, actually led to higher uh, odds of enrolling in AP classes uh, higher odds of graduating from high school and compared to non-English uh, Latinos who were not identified as English learners, they had higher, the ELs who reclassified after three years had higher college enrollment rates. So um, our waiver students, they, all, they did not do as well again as the, as the three-year students um, who had some exposure. They had lower AP um, class rates. They had lower high school graduations. And then the college enrollment was, um, there was you know, no significant results on that end. California, the story we found there, we looked at community college students. And what we did is we looked at the reclassified students. So students who had been already reclassified from English learner uh, or whatever form of English. I don't know what you guys do in California, um, <laughs> how it's structured. Whatever English learner curriculum was there, right? They reclassified and they hit college ready goals, right? Because every state has different college ready definitions. And so what we found here was that race actually played a role in predicting whether students who, Latino students who were, who, well, students who spoke Spanish were Latino and were reclassified and college ready, they were still more likely than other groups to be assigned into developmental education. So this idea that the sectors are not honoring what college ready is for these reclassified students is leading into re or, or identification into remedial work, even though they met college ready standards. And California has like four or five different ways to be college ready. And these students met all of them. So there's something really disturbing happening when the high schools are saying something is college ready and then the colleges are saying, nope, you still have to take developmental education. When we look deeper at who still took more, uh, California, what are you doing? Sorry. Um, yeah, California, what are you doing? <laughs> Cause I'm so innocent in Texas, but California, what are you doing? Um, when we looked at what students still survived the pathway and kept going in terms of, of continued credits, we found that uh, the students who, um, who spoke Spanish were still more likely and reclassified to get more credits than other college ready students, right? So it's this, it's this sad story of identification into remedial work when you're supposed to be college ready. And that yet even those who were identified, they stuck on the pathway and still received more credits after two years. So we broadly interpret this to some form of bilingual advantage, uh, persistence. I don't like the word grit because I think it, it um, sensationalizes students who have to survive. Uh, but for some reason they stayed in and, and they completed. These are phenomenal students who are surviving a system that doesn't honor their college readiness. Right. This paper is published as well. It was published in 2021. It's with Tatiana Melguizo. Um, I think I forgot the title. I think it's called Lost in Translation, but it's with Tatiana Melguizo, M-E-L-G-U-I-Z-O. You can read um, our results there. So language policy depends where you are, depends what sector we start measuring you at, and depends on the quality of the data. 
Thank you. And I know that there's a few folks in the chat mentioning that some of the policies have changed with AB 705 recently. Yes, and, exactly. And, that was big. But yes. then the pandemic happened and they couldn't follow through with a lot of students, right? I mean, which is, yeah. Great. And then somebody, uh, Maria Maldonado asked in the chat as well, how does that compare with bilingual students of English and non-Spanish language? So maybe those who speak indigenous languages, I'm, I'm going to assume that may be what it's referring to. So not um, Spanish speakers, but maybe speak another language other than Spanish, but are also English learners. Yes. So we found that our... Um... Our Asian students were not as likely to also be, they were more likely to be, um, they were less likely to be placed in remedial work. So even though you had similar scores, similar outcomes, uh, for some reason it was Latinos that were more likely to be uh, put in remedial work. So if you speak Spanish, you're more likely to be designated um, reme remedial or developmental, even though you're not supposed to be. Thank you. And I know somebody asked also about accent. Um, I'm not sure if the data allows for like that level of- Oh, no, but that's a great question. That's a great question. Well, not only accent, but also colorism. There's a lot of color, a lot of new work on colorism and how that plays a role, yes. Mm -hmm. It's Great. not in there. You need special data for that or collection, unfortunately. So one kind of follow-up question, um, um, kind of connected to the first question that we started with, um, but but are you also, or as you were doing your analysis, did you also do kind of like even deeper analysis within some of the subgroups of Latinos? So even just looking at like Mexican origin and looking deeply within that group and, and kind of these various subgroups. So there was a question about that. If you had done some of that uh, in-depth analysis within groups, or if there's like an, an interest of you moving in that direction with some of your future work. Oh, sure. There's, of course, there's, there's a lot of interest. It's time and uh, research assistance is, is the issue. Um, we did look by income, right? Mostly, so I don't know if it's, we did look deeper with the Mexicans, but we did look deeper into social characteristics of the Latino groups, right? So that's where you find out how different South Americans are upon entry than, than uh, Mexican origin groups. I mean, they have much higher incomes, they have better jobs, they have, you know, we start looking into colorism and so forth. And yeah, it just looks, so um, intersectionality, uh, yes, very important. Um, I'm sure we ran some results on that, but I think, uh, you know, what would be of interest, for example, is Mexican origin individuals in Texas versus Georgia, right? Uh, so the old diaspora, Latino diaspora versus the new Latino diaspora. And, um, and frankly, what's happening in Latino college completion in Texas versus California, right? I think that's a story um, that hasn't been sufficiently unpacked. And I know that there's also another question about um, kind of shifting to interventions a little bit. Um, what kind of interventions have you seen be successful for, for our low-income first-generation Latinx students? Yeah, so I thought uh, Patricia Gandera and uh, Francis Contreras that is, is one of the best ways that I've, I've heard it put, which is basically interventions that are acknowledge, right? The assets of language, of culture, of family, those are the ones that are most likely to move students along the pipeline. So it does matter where, I think especially early, right? In terms of the agents that identify you in school as um, valuable, as worthy of potential college and linking those to parental support and also, you know, capitalizing on the assets. So, you know, part of the issue, if we look at, if we think about it from a causal framework, right? There's only some things you can assign, but most of our interventions that have been federally funded, they're not, I mean, there's better ones on language, but broad culture and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure how many they are from a randomized experiment 
perspective. And I think sometimes we focus too much on that for anything to be valid. Um, there's certainly a time for it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I support that. But I think, again, when we sacrifice going deeper to understand what might matter for a student or methodological beauty, who are we helping? And I think that's something we have to come to terms with. And I think that's a, actually a great segue um, to, to, to this next question that somebody just posed. Um, as we try to kind of seek data that can help us kind of really know our students more deeply at, at this level to create better, better policies and interventions, can you recommend um, a template for surveying students that will help us target our instructional and support services? Or what studies can we use as a model to help us? Yeah, with? so I think this is where we have to be. Um, so I'm, I'm coming in the mostly quantitative field um, or descriptive policy field with some parts. So I, you know, I think we really have to pay attention um, to the qualitative stories, right? I think we have to pay attention and link the importance of critical milestones in the early grades and with family to later, to, you know, how that might affect long-term outcomes. Uh, some of the, the, the coolest data that can go into college and so forth, you know, like even the Texas data, so I'm, I'm research director uh, and strategy director for the Texas Data Center, which has probably the best data, state data from kindergarten to workforce in all the nation. But it has very unreliable immigrant um, variables for whatever reason, because people don't always tell the truth when they're asked, are you an immigrant now, are you undocumented? And besides, because apply the rideau, you're not supposed to ask or, or, or make any decisions based on that, right? So um, that means you can learn so much from the quantitative data, but it needs to be paired with the qualitative data. I think going deeply, this was a wonderful exercise, going deeply into these other studies who did qualitative work, and it made me realize how much is not in the surveys. But then when you read across all the qualitative work, you start to see a lot of similarities. Um, you know, so, some of it, so much of it is you know, understanding what students think helped them at, one, at certain ages, but then also parents. There's a wonderful study that looks at wealth and inequality. Heather Johnson, I think is her name. And it's a, it's, it, it's a qualitative study of parents and what they think, how they think wealth matters. And it's predominantly white parents and you learn a lot about what they think matters for college success, the American dream, how easy it is, and perceptions of who, uh, why someone is failing or not. And I, I, you know, I think we can do similar, there have been similar studies probably in the black community and, and to some extent um, the Latino community, but we have to be more creative and more attentive to culture and language because often you're gonna need researchers who understand the citizenship and language um, skills that are going to be needed to execute those studies. Thank you. And kind of building on that, um, I wanted to uh, go back to a question that was posed earlier. So what do we know from research on policies and programs that involve families in college access programs? And, and what can we learn or glean from that, kind of taking on these more like culturally attentive approaches? Okay, so can you repeat that question again? What can, no, sorry. What, what do we know from research on policies and programs that involve families and college access programs? Yeah, that's a great question. To be honest, I mostly focus on students and like parental capital that can be measured in data. Um, when I did my work on uh, in state, on the state Dream Max, I, I spent a lot of time in some communities kind of trying to understand um, how parents were, you know, uh, understanding their, uh, what was possible. And so much of it was, you know, sort of either misinformation or not understanding that that's even a possible. So policy dissemination uh, is critical and critical, not just like from an English language perspective, but also multi like educational level perspective. Um, I think now we have to update all our methods because of social media. 
So I think dissemination needs to be uh, reevaluated and redesigned. Um, and we know there's a lot of Spanish speaking folks on social media. I think my sister's TikTok is all in Spanish just because it's funnier or something. I don't know, but you know, like there's different ways to do this. So, um, I mean, you know, the research is family is very important and then gender comes into it. Uh, families are particularly important for female students. When it comes to men, it's gonna be males. It's likely gonna be work. So how does that come into it? The male perspective, my colleague, Victor Science does a lot of work on the Latino male here and his colleagues um, at UT Austin and uh, Lisa McWine at Texas A&M. So, um, you know, I think we're learning, but we haven't built a strong enough bridge between the qualitative and the quantitative work. And we haven't been at the data gathering circles to say, what we're collecting is not enough. What we're collecting is missing key populations. And we might be asking the wrong questions or we need to ask more questions. It does not fit our new demographic um, groups. It doesn't, it doesn't fit the new demography. Our surveys are outdated. So kind of a tag teaming on that, um, um, Dr. Flores, how do we get to those tables to have, or how do we advocate for data to be more representative and really more, and also to be evolving, right? As our population may also um, evolve and, and, and kind of diversify in ways that maybe haven't been as, as present in the past. So, so yeah. if any thoughts. I mean, it, you know, so much of it is about representation, but representation is deeply connected to stratification and power. So going to Harvard didn't hurt me, right? And getting certain people, getting certain advisors and then getting recommended by them to be on certain panels and so forth. You know, so I think acknowledging stratification is part of our issue and our problem. I think that the more we put uh, Latinos on the public policy agenda, um, you know, eventually they're gonna have to realize, you know, that they need more of us. And one person can't be on six tables at once. So we recommend each other, right? There's various ways to do this, uh, but I think part of it's gonna be acknowledging that the old system of representation and recommendation is not equitable. And so on that note, um, today we released um, a set of principles on how to have more, uh, on more equitable policy making that centers racial equity. The report is uh, released by the Institute for Higher Education Policy. Um, so I, um, I was lucky enough to be the organizer on that, McCall Kurlander. Uh, on your faculty was part of that advisory group. It was an advisory group of about 15 people, I think, uh, from all over higher ed and legal circles. And together, we came up with a set of five principles for more equitable policy making and decision making in higher education, which part of it means representation at the table of the people you plan to, you know, that supposedly you're trying to help. Um, acknowledging the history of exclusion and creating more inroads for inclusion, understanding that data matters and data stories are also limited. So you need to have human stories present. Um, and so, and there's, I don't know, there's a couple more, I'm sorry, I blanked out there. But uh, if you look up um, Institute for Higher Ed Policy, five principles of equity making, um, Oh, look, McCall, thank you. Just put it on the chat. I mean, that's one way to start. We thought about it from the policy making perspective, right? So not just like, here's a policy. Oh, let's apply it on Latinos and see if it works. No, it goes from the beginning, the construction, the structure, the representation of who is there, who gets to be at the table. That's essential foundational part of equitable policy making in higher ed, in state legislatures, and federal, any any jurisdiction. Great. 
Great, thank you. So, so we have a few more questions. Um, so, so I'm gonna merge uh, two questions or, or thoughts together. Um, but one person asked, um, um, Dr. Josephine Moreno asked, given that UC Davis is an emerging HSI, could you please share with us some immediate actions that we can do or um, enact to achieve student success? And, and, and another question that came through was really about like how can our cultures of higher education, um, how can we facilitate stronger cultures of belonging for students? So if you can talk about what we can do as an, as an emerging HSI and how can we enhance um, belonging sure. in higher ed? I'll give my perspective, but you have people there that already know how to answer this. They just need to be at the table and provide their research. Marcela, Dr. Cuella, you have so, I mean, you could answer these questions better than I can. Um, and you have uh, Dr. Kurlander who like, has a whole data empire that can give you evidence on everyone and their mother. So um, yeah, I mean, UC Davis has everything they need to figure this out. You just gotta get the right people at the table. I will say one of the biggest issues, given that UC Davis is, is an emerging HSI, not quite there, almost there, that you can do is probably link up with your community college, right? At the, if you think about the four year, um, immediate four year entries, that's already a more privileged student, a student that is likely, you know, to not need remediation, is entering a UC. So that's a different kind of student that's gonna require or uh, probably need a different kind of intervention, right? Um, or different elements of an intervention. You want to make the most impact, work with your community college students. Prepare for the non-traditional student who's likely to start at a community college, has a different form, if not enhanced form of drive and reason and mission to finish the four-year degree. So one of the most important issues in higher education is executing that transfer function. I know California has done some work on it, but have you done it in a way that's more effective for Latino populations who are the majority, right, of the group that you're going to be serving? And supposedly that uh, if UC Davis, when UC Davis becomes an HSI, should be ready to, um, to serve. So, uh, yeah, and then the other issue is, what does it mean to be Hispanic serving? Gina Garcia has done a lot of work on this. I know you have as well. So what does it mean to be Hispanic serving in the context of California state policy? It's gonna look a little different than Florida. You need to acknowledge what it is and uh, work within those constraints. And so you segue me to another question that uh, Dr. Kurlander had posed is, um, are you seeing differences in state financial aid policies that impact uh, Latino college success? Uh, yeah, the key issue right now is that the federal financial aid policy is, has become more merit-based and it has need-based, right? Sue Dinarski, who will be here in a few weeks and was actually one of my mentors when I was at Harvard, I was one of her RAs and now, um, anyway, it's it's, yeah, I'm a big girl now, so I guess we're friends. I don't know. But um, <laughs> basically, you know, Sue, Sue has written prolifically and beautifully on this. And, and I cite her all the time, mostly for saying how so much of the federal aid is less about need-based and now more about merit or parental loans and so forth. Um, and so we are becoming a financial aid system. And I wrote something recently on this as well. Um, where taxpayer money is, is, is less and less about helping the needy. And so our values, our orientation toward how to help low-income students uh, has changed. And we need to bring it back to, I think it's original intent, right? Um, and so the primary problem is that we're more merit-based than we are need-based. That's a problem because merit-based is so, uh, tied to test scores, which is so tied to income and other forms of capital. So I, think, I mean, there's nothing wrong with giving kids scholarships or student scholarships, but I think, you know, the public policy is about uh, making hard choices with public resources for those that are most likely to benefit. So there's that. Um, 
So where Latinos live, I'm gonna answer it this way. I'm not sure if it's the way Dr. Kurlander uh, envisioned. Where Latinos live matters because though in terms of state money, merit aid drives most, most of the state money uh, in terms of financial aid. And it's broadly called financial aid. It's, this, it's not called, and so that means scholarships for students, whoever they wanna give it to. The institutions too are definitely more merit aid oriented too. So if you live in a state that is less likely to give aid to low-income students, yeah, that's gonna affect your access and your completion formula. Because completing without money is, 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 is I think, the bigger problem. So we have uh, two more questions. And so this next one um, is tied to the HSI um, conversations. Um, um, Joseph Martinez asks, what suggestions and prog progress could be made towards changing policies on how um, the US Department of Education defines HSI? Um, for example, um, undocumented students and AB 540 students are included in the denominator, but not the numerator. Um, and so how could we, um, how could you know, the, this kind of policy um, be included when identifying um, who the student population is to be accounted for HSI designation? That's a fascinating question, Joseph. Um, I think that you should write a dissertation on this or do your next study. I don't know, you might be Dr. Martinez, I apologize. Um, I don't see doctor in front of your name, but uh, so if I were asked this question, I would start with like going to the policy people, the Deborah Santiago's and, and getting, um, so since, I, you know, this sounds like a lot of it um, has to do with policy analysis for, um, uh, sorry, somebody's calling me, um, policy, like the policy strategy, right, for, the, for this very particular question. So how would you go about it? I think maybe run some analyses on what you gain or what you lose if you change the formula. Um, but so much of it is going to be, um, I don't want to say political game, but it's going to be a policy, a political policy exercise to get there. And it may be, why not, why don't states have their own HSI policies? Why don't states create their own fund for HSIs? Why do we have to, I mean, they do whatever they want with the, the state funding for institutions. Why not, if they know that eight, having four-year HSIs, two-year HSIs plays a role in increasing Latino college completion, why not create a program that further enhances that if the data says they already have a winner? Let's make it more, even, and even more effective. And I think with your findings, um, Dr. Flores, we can start making those arguments more powerfully with evidence. Um, yes. So thank you for, for that work. Um, and so we do have one last question. I think it ties in nicely um, as you were describing that, that this could be an area of research, right? That somebody could do demonstrating this, this impact. And uh, Edith Figueroa asked, um, and I know we've had other, other prospective graduate students or even graduate students um, listening in, but, um, what, so Edith asks, as a first-generation Mexican-American woman, California resident, U.S. citizen, which area should I study at a master's or doctorate level to make uh, moves that will be longitudinal? So maybe you can just give advice to some of our prospective graduate students or graduate students as they're thinking about the areas to expand or, or build on their research um, that, that can help them advance moving forward. Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, I started choosing jobs based on like where I could see a long-term research agenda. Also, I you know, wanted to make sure I liked the people, but um, you know, uh, New York City had a wonderful data uh, uh, database for the whole district. It's the largest district in the nation. So that was very encouraging. So when I recruited graduate students that were interested in qu quantitative work, for example, I was like, you can get in on these projects. You can do a dissertation on this. You know, you take the right courses, you learn the right security protocols. Like, um, where do you, if you're interested in, in that kind of research, that would be, you know, I would choose a place that has, if, you know, again, depends on the mode of research you're looking at. 
um, that has those possibilities, right? I train my graduate students to be, um, I get this is literate, the word, I don't know if literate, so literate in various state data sets, right? So they came out knowing two or three already, and now they know they're you know, working on four or five or six already. So I think that's important. Um, I came back to Texas. You know, I have family here, but it's also a great research institution. And it's the place that matters so much to me, right? It's where I want to make policy relevant. But that, I also didn't stay in Texas. I went all over the place and kept studying Texas. So you don't have to necessarily stay in the state. I think you look for, um, you know, places, is there, are there professors doing good research? Are there professors that could be open to uh, research in the areas that you want? Um, and what do you want to do with your life five years from now? What kind of skills do you think you need to get to be in that position? And uh, what kind of capital can you gain from that, from that institution, right? And faculty are, are huge. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Flores. Um, I want to thank you again for joining us and um, um, sharing with, the, with us some of your um, powerful research. And these are conversations that we're having across our campus. So on behalf of Provost Krogan and the entire UC Davis Forums Committee, I want to thank you. And so again, I hope that you can hear our applause and oh. feel um, our love to you. And thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. You're such a great moderator. <laughs> so. All right. Be safe. Bye. And thank you everyone for joining. Thank you.